Welcome to the Ask for the Skinny podcast with a guest. I'm proud to present I'm Alexandra Cedar. She's an actress and so much more. And please, what's your story? Tell us about yourself. Oh, Peter, start with a big question, right? <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm an actor. I have been a professional actor since I was about 18 years old. I'm an American, as you can hear. But I have spent the majority of my life in Europe. I moved here about 29 years ago to Germany. This was not the first time I had lived in Europe, but it was the first time I was living in Germany. And I came here for love, not my career, and somehow have managed to make both work. And I'm not sure which is more of a miracle <laughs> after 29 years. Um, but when I first moved to Germany, I didn't speak English. Uh, of English. I didn't speak German. And so that was obviously a stumbling block because you need to be able to communicate in order to act. Even if you don't always need to speak, you need to understand. So I really didn't see a way forward with it, to be very honest. And um, for the first couple of years, we had a family right away. We had our son. And the first couple of years, I was very immersed in, in that. But after a couple of years, I started to look around and I think I'd seen a poster somewhere for the American Drama Group in Munich. And I was like, aha, that's it. And then I went down and I made an appointment and I auditioned. And the man, Grantley Marshall, who ran the theater company, was very nice. And he said, welcome aboard, you know. And he whips out this calendar and he says to me, here's our touring schedule. And I was like, oh touring schedule. That's no, I'm so sorry. I have a baby. I can't do that. And I, I was mortified on a couple of levels that I hadn't done any research beforehand and that I kind of wasted this man's time. And I get up and apologizing profusely. I'm just about to close the door behind me. And on a whim, I lean back in and I say, do you happen to know anybody in Munich that I could contact? And he gave me two names. And these two people became pivotal in launching my voiceover career, which led to presenting work, which led to commercial work. So when I say that I had this 16-year hiatus from acting, it was from the true craft of being an actor, like the sink your teeth into the roles kind of a experience of what I became an actor for. But I was still doing acting adjacent stuff. And I was earning a pretty good living with that. There was a really thriving um, need for American voiceover people and presenters with all of these huge German and mid-level mid German companies as well who were trying to break into or who were, you know, on the world market. And then I had a a standing movie date with my son, who at this point is 16 years old, so smash cut to 16 years in the future. And uh, Thursday, he comes to me and he says, Mom, do you mind if I don't hang out with you tomorrow or any weekend going forward for the rest of my life? Because <laughs> I want to hang out with my friends. <laughs> this was 16, right? And I was like, oh, I knew the day was coming. And it was sort of bittersweet. But the interesting thing was it, it, for the first time in 16 years, even though I had been working, we still had a really traditional marriage. So I was the one responsible for our son. I had a lot of free time with the job I was doing, even like on the best of days when I had four and five studio appointments in a day, I was still, you know, done and, and flexible enough to go pick up my son from daycare, bring him with me to the studio and home in plenty of time to play with him, make dinner, get him in bed, all of those things. So when he, he said that, it was the first time I had really had a chance to think about, well, what do I want to do? And I, I thought, well, you know, it'd be really fun just to act again. And so I sat down and I Googled acting workshop. Munich English. And one popped up, one popped up with one seat available. And I immediately, you know, pulled out my credit card, saved that spot and showed up the next day. And three days later, it was everything I had hoped it would be. I don't know what my life would look like now if it had been a big drag, because it would not have 
re-sparked it. I feel like there was a pilot light burning inside me all this time for my acting. And when I took that <clears throat> that workshop, it just kind of combusted into flame. And I came home knowing that I needed to get back into it and relaunch my career. And that's when I also realized uh, that I was damn rusty. <laughs> I hadn't really acted in 16 years. And so this is what I often find, Peter, is that your, your problem is often the key to the solution. So I was rusty. I needed more training. That was the first kind of revelation. Okay, I need more training. The second thing was, okay, uh, I don't want to add the layer of having to do my training in German on top of it. I just want to be able to act freely and react freely and without having to interpret and translate and all of that. And so I could have either have flown to New York, LA, London, and gotten amazing high caliber training that I was craving, but prohibitively expensive, both time-wise and financially, to make that something that was would have been viable for me more than a couple of times a year. Because I was, even though my son didn't want to hang out with me on the weekends, I still was making him breakfast and helping him with his homework and all of that jazz. So the second obstacle was, well, I don't have the training I need here in Munich. So that became the solution to my second problem. And I decided, well, I'll just bring the training to me. And I began to reach out to amazing coaches that I had always heard about and wanted to work with. And I knew that if I could just organize a handful of other actors to take the workshops with me, that I could get those workshops for the same investment that I would have been paying if they were already in Munich. That was my only goal. And what ended up very quickly happening was I was able to organize it so that I was getting the training for free. I was building an amazing community of really supportive actors who were on the same journey that I was on, at the same level that I was at. And I was earning, you know, a thousand to a couple thousand euros per workshop. So all of a sudden, what started out as, as this one thing very quickly became beneficial on many levels. But at this point, I was pretty myopic. My only real goal was just get the training I need, get the confidence I was lacking, because I was lacking confidence in my skills, make the connections I needed to find out who the good agents were, who the casting directors were, and get going. And that's what I did. And a year and a half later, I launched my career and I stopped doing the workshops for a little while. So that was kind of phase one. And I, now I, I, do you have any questions or anything you want to say? I've just been like monologuing here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm astonished how, how, how easy you made it seem. Uh, like I just found the coach and then organized a workshop and everybody came. So, and you talk about community. Um, can, can you tell us a bit more about community? Because uh, right now, internet is all about community building. Yes. How did that go um, when you started? Yes. What was the so, the, the, uh, yeah, the... I have quite a few thoughts about this, actually. I think, first of all, now, we're, flash forward again, 11 years uh, uh, after I started to relaunch my acting career. And what I've realized is that there are five pillars of a thriving acting career, frankly, a thriving anything, you know, it, it, especially when you are the brand, is mindset, branding, marketing, networking, and community. And true community comes from bringing people together who share a passion and are on equal footing. It's not, and I think this is where a lot of people really kind of miss the mark with it, especially when they're first starting. They're like, I'm the expert, I'm the expert, let's build a community around me. And I, I just as a human being and as an actor, and again, someone who coaches a lot of people who 
are themselves their own personal brand, because that's what actors are, there's a ton of imposter syndrome. And as a business owner, right, I've also coached with some of these really big uh, business coaches like James Wedmore and Sonny Leonard Doozy and Amy Porterfield, Jasmine Starr, right? There are a lot of them out there. And what I always see again and again in the communities, about once a week, someone will post something to the effect of, I'm dealing with imposter syndrome, guys, anybody else? And all of a sudden, like, it'll just like get this flurry of, yes, 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 me too. And, you know, and oh, this is, you know, and, and I'm so glad to hear somebody else say that. And, and, and I think uh, that comes back to this thing is that we've all, and I was, I think led to believe this as well, not, not through malintention, but, um, but I also believe that you only needed to be two steps ahead of someone in order to teach them. But I, I've come to believe that if you're only two steps ahead, ahead of someone, you're always looking over your shoulder, wondering when those people are going to catch up with you. And you're never feeling secure in where you're at and the point that you're teaching from. So what I found was when I, I, I didn't even, you know, again, my goal was to get the training. My goal was not to create a community. It just happened to be a happy uh, byproduct of getting the training. But I think because I, I went about it in a way where I was like, I love acting. I am looking for other people who love acting and who are hopefully also something like I am. In, in the sense of maybe you had to take a break because of life or whatever, or maybe you studied acting in college but didn't really have the courage to pursue it after college, whatever it is. But someone who had wanted to go the professional route of being an actor, who had begun that professional route, and then for some reason had to stop it. So I was looking for people who were like me, and I think that that is the first thing in community, is finding like-minded people who share your passion. And the second part of it is, is, is making it that we're in it together. Not like I am telling you how to do this, but we are doing this together. We are learning together. Does that make sense? Yes, I have just yeah. one question. Yeah. Um, so I have many questions, but would like to use one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you said that, that uh, the two of the points are networking and community. So mm -hmm. to understand correctly that uh, basically networking is uh, the precursor to build a community. So that you meet people that you can then include in the community. Is that correct? Interesting. Uh, I think it actually goes the other way, Peter. Okay. I think first you 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 create because networking to me is all about building professional friendships. And a friendship starts with an authentic relationship. So if now that you and I know each other a little bit, if I were in your neck of the woods and we happen to meet up for a coffee and I know someone else, then I could say, you know, hey, this is Peter. I was on his podcast. He does this and that he helps, you know, people facing this and this problem. And I think the two of you would get along. Then it, it's, it becomes something that is an extension of an original relationship. Now, community are truly the people who, who, who know where you're at right now. So it's small, right? It's not necessarily, and of course there are degrees to this as well, because our family belongs to our community as well, our family, friends, relatives. But we all have or at least I certainly do, have those family members, distant family members, who have no idea what I'm doing. And I have no idea what they're doing. So just because someone is part of your family doesn't make them part of your community. What what really makes the difference is that they're, they're supportive and you are supportive of them. And I think it's... Uh, and from that, you are going to get the best and most natural connections to add to your network. This is why, can I tell you, I don't know where I heard this anymore. 
might have been Marie Forleo. But um, if you make a list of 20 people who you would feel comfortable reaching out to in one form or another, and some of these may require a little courage, but <laughs> reach out to them anyway, and you make a list of these people and you rate them on a scale from one to five, how willing are they to help me and how able are they to help me? So for instance, my mom might be a, a five and she's willing to help me. How able she is to help me is maybe a two, <laughs> a one, I don't know, not very high, right? So you, you rate them according to that. And then on the other hand, I may have met someone who knows someone and we're not really great friends, but they are part of my network. So they may be a five on ability to help me, but how willing they are to help me is maybe a one because why should they, right? They're not invested. We don't know each other. So make that list. You start with the people that are the easiest, right? The, the highest in ability to help you, also the highest in the ability to, uh, in, in their willingness to help you. And you kind of work your way down it. But it doesn't mean you don't approach the people who are down at the bottom of the list. But for instance, that person who is really high on my list of ability to help me, but very low on willingness to help me, there is the obstacle. And the obstacle always presents the solution. The problem that person is not willing to help me is because they don't know me, they're not invested in me, they don't care about me, which is normal. And so what can I do to make myself more valuable to that person? And so first try those things. First, you know, you can, we all leave clues on social media, right? That's one thing. What did, maybe they have a new baby. Maybe they have a new dog. Maybe they just started taking skiing lessons. Who knows? Do you know anything about those? Can you recommend a coach, a dog trainer, a great babysitter? Can you make yourself valuable in some way without saying, now you owe me? right? And do that a few times. And human nature is reciprocal. And when you are able to do that a few times, and the other thing that I recommend is when you've done that, follow up. Hey, did you ever get in touch with that dog trainer I, I connected you with? Or um, what did you think? You know, I hope that worked out for you. How's little bow wow doing? Whatever it is, make it an easy way for them to answer you as well because that is going to spark the conversation and give you another chance to respond to them, throwing that ball back and forth. And eventually you're more than just minuscule acquaintances. Now you are building a business friendship and you're a little bit higher in their willingness category. And then you can reach out. Uh, so you, you mentioned the imposter syndrome with the actors yes social anxiety syndrome for uh, community and network building how can we overcome that well i just gave you a great example on how to overcome the networking um for let's tackle it one at a time so imposter syndrome always comes from feeling like you're not enough not worthy and these are limiting beliefs that we all create, that are created as children. And one of the exercises that I do with my actors to help them discover the things that have been holding them back, and this would work actually with any passion that you have. It doesn't have to be acting. But you can say my passion is to, I don't know, um, Give me a passion. I don't know. Writing. I've always wanted to be a writer. Say something like that, right? What are the things that have always pulled me in the direction of writing? What are the things that always pulled me away about writing? What is it that writing gives me? What is it? Why have I not followed up on that? And kind of write your life story from that point of view, thinking about it from that point of view. And you can... Some incidences in our lives will have had an effect on that, whether we realize it or not. So if something pops in your head and you're like, oh, I don't know, that doesn't 
seem to have anything to do with writing, but it's there. Put it in. It's your story for you. Then the, the magic kind of comes when you read it or tell it to a group of people. Three to five people is a great group, could be bigger. Does not have to be performed. And I know people have social anxiety about this. The, the main thing is, is you think of it like a TED talk almost, right? Or you could pre-record it and send it to people as well, though it's not as effective. And then you, what you're looking for is not, did you like it? What you're looking for is people to help you spot the patterns. And you don't want anyone to interrupt you. You should be able to get through it by yourself. This is usually a highly emotional, cathartic experience for the people who do it. I've not, I can count on one hand the times people have not cried in telling these stories. And then the, the listeners will be able to point out your patterns and also words will come. Resilience, determination, um, things like, you know, empathy, compassion. Words will pop out at, at, at you, the, the teller as well. And then the final thing is, is to go off by yourself a 24 hours later, have time to sleep on it and go off by yourself and ask, what are the stories that I have begun to tell myself around these incidences? What, what are the beliefs that I have formed around this? And lastly, it comes to challenging those beliefs because at the end of the day, a belief is just that. It is nothing more. It is not a fact. It is a belief. And all beliefs can be challenged. And we, a belief often in our lives is so often retold that we we just take it as dogma. This is this is how it is. And it's not how it is. I mean if you think of the sky, right? This the sky is blue. Is that your belief? Sure, it's most people's belief, right? But if you look at it, this right now my sky is very gray. But there are times when the sky is purple and red and orange and yellow or black or green when there's a tornado or so and Honestly, human beings see the perceive, perceive the sky as blue, but there are other living creatures on this planet that don't see it that way because that's not how their eyeballs work. So it is just a belief and you can always challenge any belief. And I encourage people to do that. <laughs> Long-winded, <laughs> I know. Great. Can we talk about your next project? Yes. So right now, I, I've had a coaching program called Get Better Roles. This is for trained actors, and I help them to finally get control over their career so that they can get the opportunities to audition for the kinds of roles they feel like they're ready for and deserve. But my journey to relaunching my career and then through, through these workshops... So I, I think I explained phase one of it, which was all about the getting the training and becoming an expert again, finding that bridge from my passion to making it my profession. The phase two of it became whenever I needed money, I would just throw in a workshop. So I was like, oh, these are useful just for making income. And now phase three, which is what I'm still in with it, is all about using these workshops as a way to offer value to the people that I would like to work with as an actor. So casting directors, showrunners, producers, whatever it is, because I'm literally offering them something of value and it gives me the opportunity to sit down and speak with them eye to eye as a human being to a human being, not a lowly actor to a big time producer, whatever it is. And then we get to know each other as, as two people who both have this passion for the film industry. And if I then feel it's necessary or still want to participate in the workshop, I can do that. And then they can also see me as an actor. So it's become an amazing tool to network in a way with, with people that I never would have had the chance to network with. So this has 
this and many, many conversations with many people who are dissatisfied with their lives and don't see a way into making a living from the thing that truly lights them up. They see it as a hobby, but they don't see it as a way to earn it, earn an income or earn a steady income. Cheers, Shotzi. Um, or, or any of that. And so that is, that is exactly why I created Passion Project to Pro, because it is literally turning what you love into what you do without having to be an expert influencer or coach. And the way it works is uh, week one, we get together with the participants and help them to ideate, figure out what is that thing, that, that burning passion, that burning curiosity that you have. What is the best type of event for that? All the way through to, you know, finding the experts, finding the participants, how to price it, where to, where to put it on, all of these different things, right, that are involved with putting on events. And then, to so the second to last time we meet, they are getting ready to launch their events. And then we have a two-week kind of hiatus in there. So everybody has a chance to launch their event. And then we get back together for the very last coaching call and do a debrief. What worked? What didn't work? What are you going to do better next time? So that everybody, my goal is that everybody has a win at the end of this and that uh, they earn their investment back by the time of, before the course is even over, they should have earned their investment back. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Uh, so before we finish this, uh, I would like to ask you for one trade secret or a trick that you can share with our listeners and viewers. Well, let's see. One of my favorite things, I have, can I share two? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Um, I think often you just need to start messy. I mean, that sounds pretty simple, but people don't do it. They they think everything needs to be perfect. And so they're always planning and waiting and and learning and and doing all these things that are keeping them from actually taking action. And it's the action that is going to give you the confidence and is going to help create that new identity that you're trying to create for yourself. So start messy, take imperfect action, because imperfect action is always better than no action at all, at all. And when you just take those first couple of steps that puts you on the road, you can just see that much further down the road. And it helps to know, okay, where am I going? Am I going to need to take a right turn, a left turn? Am I going to go over a hill or down in a valley? But but the the more steps you take, the more you will see and the more you will know. But you must take the steps. So that's it. Take action. Start messy, imperfect action. And the other thing is, and this goes with that, is get comfortable with being uncomfortable because growth does not happen within our comfort zone. And your big, beautiful dreams are not inside of your comfort zone. They are outside of it. And every tiny step you take, they don't have to be huge leaps and bounds but consistently taking small steps to expand the boundaries of your comfort zone is going to put what scared you yesterday behind you. And of course, yes, new things will come that scare you today. But the beauty is, is in taking that action and building that confidence that we talked about in starting messy, you are going to know that you got this and you can do it. And that's it. Thank you very much for this yeah. And before we finish, where can our audience uh, get you, get uh, uh, more info about you, uh, see your content? What, what is the best way? Uh, I am so easy to find. I'm Anna Alexander Cedar, S I E D E R, all over the place. But if you would like to uh, go to my link tree, it's act 
underscore bold, act, Linktree act underscore bold. And if, I don't know if your li listeners have been inspired to maybe want to try and put on their own event, but if you would like to do that, there you can download a free, I think it's a 27-page workbook, maybe a 22-page workbook, something like that. But it's a, it's a pretty comprehensive workbook that will definitely get you started in creating your own events, and that's free to download. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for being my guest. Thank you.